Good evening, uh, or good afternoon, or good morning, whenever you're watching this. So I want to pick up where we left off for plant molecular biology. Quick caveat, uh, I'm recording at home, so if you hear weird miscellaneous sounds, that's just life in the background. Uh, on screen, though, you see hopefully a familiar picture of where we were in class. So as I said, I'll back up and uh, cover a little bit of ground. I did add a little to this and I do realize I have not uploaded it to Blackboard but I will upload this to Blackboard and I've made the um, presentation a, a little more informative hopefully since the one I gave in class. So let's continue. So the topic uh, we're covering that week and this week is genome structure. So plant genomes, we established how um, cells and plant cells in particular gain their chloroplast and their mitochondria uh, through endosymbiotic theory and how giving a slight reason possibly for how they have their own genomes and are able to replicate. So let's get that there. And there's a familiar slide. So uh, I want to talk a little bit first about the chloroplast or the plastid genomes and the mitochondrial genomes and then we'll talk about the nuclear genome which is what we typically talk about when we talk about genomes. Um, again, as was answered in class correctly, it's all the hereditary material, uh, genes and not genes, and we'll get into that structure after we talk about the cytoplasmic genomes. All right, so this is a slide we saw, plant cytoplasmic genomes. We have the plastids on the left, mitochondrial on the right. I already talked about basic differences in their length and size, and that's because mitochondrial genomes have a lot more repeats, uh, longer strands of repetitive DNA, which are generally meaningless um, as far as coding goes. They may serve some other function. They may be remnants of the past. Who knows? Um, and then here in the lower left were pictures of, uh, in this case, chromatids uh, genomes. So not exactly looking like our nuclear genome, nor like that of a bacterial genome. So they kind of have a unique... Uh, polyploidy. So we'll talk about polyploidy and how genomes are duplicated later towards the end of the semester. It's the last section. We'll go through this again. We'll revisit genomes in light of the number of genomes. So we're just going to figure for right now a single genome. Uh, in plants, yes, you can have a number of different genomes. So uh, something I've added is right down here in the lower left, both mitochondrial genomes and plastid genomes exhibit vegetative segregation. I think you'll like this, especially those of you who are in horticulture. You've probably heard reference to variegated or uh, plants of various sorts. We'll talk about that and talk a little bit about how that happens with leaves. Um, I think I remember mentioning it, Emily, you might remember as well, in plant propagation with Dr. Ralsop, we uh, discussed and saw the difference in these. And we know that a lot of people like buying those horticulturally. Well, how are those done through breeding? Today we'll talk just briefly about how that even happens to begin with in nature. So vegetative segregation is the word. Vegetative segregation in cytoplasmic genomes. So we're talking in this case of cytoplasmic genomes, specifically of plastid genomes. So you can see um, from tasty landscape there, there's a variegated citrus. So um, you may or may not have seen fruit before. We don't usually... Um, <laughs> except for uniqueness, you, know, you breed for different colors of fruit. But we do like these aesthetically, right, in our yard or in our greenhouse or in our window sills. So this just kind of naturally happens. Uh, it can happen from a mutation uh, during the process of mitosis. But, uh, but, you know, in the breeding process, you can also try to select for that mutation. You get more and more of this. So that's not just a single mutation on one leaf, two leaves, or a... a sporadic leaves, you want to get it everywhere, right? So it looks at least uniform variegation. So yeah, we're going to talk about this right now and just how this can occur. So to do that, vegetative segregation is what it's called. And first, uh, you can take any vegetative cell, leaf in this case, as we saw in these pictures. Um, and if we think about a leaf cell, stem cell, flower cell, or fruit cell, as opposed to say a gamete. So if you remember in mitosis, or a meiosis, excuse me, of sexual reproduction, and you're left with half a copy of the genome uh, after prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 1, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 2, and then you have a gamete. 
This is not what we're talking about. That only happens in the ovary, and it only happens in pollen. Uh, we're talking about vegetative cells or growth. Normal growth occurs by mitosis. So a vegetative cell can give rise to another vegetative cell via mitosis, and that can be genetically different. This is amazing because, again, this is something most people are not used to. Even if they've taken a general biology class, they've never heard of this. Mitosis is supposed to result in something completely identical, genetically identical. It's the difference between sexual and asexual, but here in plants it's possible, uh, and actually quite frequent in higher angiosperms, less frequent in gymnosperms, but conifers can do this as well. Um, but they are genetically different cells that came from a vegetative cell. And, and we can do this in biotechnology. You clip a leaf or something, and you can uh, propagate and figure out a way to propagate those cells or clone those cells. You can grow a plant from a cell and tissue culture. So a leaf cell containing maybe two genetically distinct plastids, uh, it's, po it's possible that in their separation, you kind of have to imagine this, and the next slide we'll talk about it, but... You have to imagine that separation from one cell to two, if it just so happens that all of one type of genetically distinct plastid goes in one direction and one genetically distinct plastid goes in the other, well, now you have two cells with two different genomes in their plastids. The cells themselves are identical, but the plastids within them can still be distinct genomes. So this is pretty crazy to think about. So mitosis typically divides the cell that is the cytokinesis right after mitosis, and the plastids are randomly distributed to daughter cells. So one daughter cell receives one type of genome, another cell the other type of genome, or it's even possible to get a mix, uh, which is typically what we do see. You kind of have to breed for one genome or the other, but no one can see an albino genome uh, plastid surviving very long. So this is how it happens. You might look in the center here and recognize Typical G1 phase, this is that first growth when the signal comes from other cytokinins, which are simply uh, cell signals to phosphorylate to say, yes, it's time to divide. The first thing that must happen is we have to synthesize DNA. So DNA replicates itself. We just talked about that the last couple weeks. As it continues to copy its DNA into uh, a pair of chromatids, it continues to grow and undergoes mitosis. That's what this represents, pro, meta, and a telophase. And in cytokinesis, we have two cells up here at the top where there used to be just one cell. So that's what we've learned so far. It's typical mitosis of a plant cell. Now within that plant cell, if you're going to have two cells, you'll notice that one, two, three, one, two, three, have three plastids or chromoplasts in each cell, right? I mean, if you're going to split, that new cell has to have everything that the original cell had. So all those organelles have to be duplicated. That happens in G2. So in first thing to replicate is DNA. And as DNA in the S phase is replicated, now all the organelles, Golgi apparatus, ER, extra membrane, lysosomes, and in our case today, bing, plastids have to reproduce. And so right here we're going to kind of pull out, and here's differentiation, cell cycle arrest, or the endocycle. So as the cell expands and gets ready to divide, the cell is larger now. Uh, a step is occurring here. So plastic division is a little different. It's more like, well, right here, you have the endocycle, the growth, and DNA replication. So here is kind of the mother plasmid, if you will, or plastid. It duplicates. Bloop. Very, very similar binary fission to what bacteria do. And now you have two individual plastids where you used to have one plastid. Again, going along that cycle, right? Duplicates the genome. The membranes unzip and you have two. Now you just have to use a little imagination and if either of these plastids or if there were a mutated plastid it was also replicating in here you know it may not all be green. So here's the example and this is from a textbook we use plant physiology in Dr. Remley's class. So vegetative segregation can lead to variegation and here's how. Follow carefully. So you see this flower uh, and you have some white leaves, and here you have some white spotted leaves, and here you have all green leaves. So how are each of those uh, possible? How do these come about? Well, uh, vegetative segregation can lead to this variegation through cell division in a cell with 
both normal, that is green. So we're going to look right here in the middle, green sector producing variegation. So both normal green and mutant white. So here's the mutant plastid. And they both exist in the same cell of that leaf, that leaf cell. Uh, and by chance, it can result in offspring with only mutant organelles. So here's this case. So if this happens and begins to spread, you get wider stripes or segments of the leaf or even entire leaves that have a white sector, right? Well, mutants. Uh, cells that contain then these exclusively white chloroplasts lead to the white sectors in which no cell arises that contains only white chloroplasts stay green throughout. So this would be your normal leaf. So if mitosis, this cell were to go through a cell cycle and split, and we duplicated each of these, and you had a plast, uh, had a cell, excuse me, that had all the normal plastids, well then you have these leaves. And clearly this happens more frequently. And variegation then can also uh, be caused by mutations in mitochondrial and nuclear genomes. This is just one example uh, using plastids, right? Uh, but you can see here in the middle, um, so there's an all green and all white, and typically then this is more likely than not. A new cell with a mixture of wild type, which is green, and mutant plastids, which are white. And this is kind of what gives rise to these leaves, again, which we more often see in pictures like this. Right? And that's how you get variegation. It's, uh, it's a phenomena of mitosis. Right? So you have genomes. We talked a little bit about... Uh, structure genomes, they're smaller, they're very similar to bacterial genomes, although they are polyploidy, that's what this little picture is supposed to be showing, they look like hair, so they have a little bit of physically uh, different structure than what you would see under a microscope of a typical cell. Um, the genes are exclusive to photosynthesis in the case of plastids or, or respiration in the case of mitochondria. Uh, the really odd thing, which I don't think I mentioned in writing here, but I talked about it in class, is that a lot of the proteins necessary for respiration and photosynthesis are encoded in the nuclear genome and then shipped. Uh, the transcripts are shipped to the mitochondria where the ribosomes in the mitochondria will translate that message into a protein. It's a little difficult to talk about right now because that's actually the next topic we're leading into. But before we get into that, so there's our variegation again. Now you know it's due to mitosis and because mitosis occurs with the plastids as well if you have a mutated plastid you might get one green and one white or several white ones as we see in in this case here yep and variegation Ta -da! you can tell all your friends this is an anomaly of mitosis unlike they've ever learned before so now the nuclear genome structure I have about two minutes to go through this one. Now, it's going to be less because you already are familiar with it. It will be done in two minutes. So there's your chromosome. But just in case, to remind us, a chromosome really is made up of two chromatids, sister chromatids. So this chromatid is an identical copy of this chromatid. This was duplicated in the S phase of mitosis, or uh, S phase of the cell cycle, right? So before a cell was made, it really only needs one copy of the genome. Unless the message comes, it needs to duplicate. It goes to the S phase and makes another copy. The two sister chromatids are held together at the centromere. The centromere is a very dense region of DNA, as is the telomere. This is for protective regions. Remember, there's nucleases, proteins that would degrade DNA all over the cell. So having telomeres and centromeres being tightly bound regions of DNA uh, means it can be protected from those enzymes that would try to attack the DNA molecule. So these are chromatids. They're condensed. And they form a chromosome. Now, a chrom chromatin, which is what I've told you guys is the structure of DNA, is like this. So this is tightly coiled, tight, uh, super coiled. This is uh, the molecule of DNA, and generally we see it like this. This is chromatin. This is uh, DNA wrapped around histone proteins. And this is tightly coiled, unusable. So nuclear genomes are packed into two forms of chromatin, heterochromatin and euchromatin. The one we're most interested in is euchromatin. So spend some time looking at this slide, and you'll find out that this is a gene-rich region where most active genes are found. This is the part we're going to spend time studying. 
You can look at this just for comparison. 